How do you feel about mystery? Do you ever read mysteries, thrillers, or detective stories? Have you ever read the novels of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? You are undoubtedly familiar with his most famous creation, Sherlock Holmes. You've probably seen him on stage or in the moving pictures. Sherlock Holmes first appeared in the 1887 novel by Conan Doyle called A Study in Scarlet. The novel takes its name from this line spoken by Holmes to his friend and chronicler, Dr. Watson, who also made his first appearance in this book. Suffice it to say that A Study in Scarlet is a good old fashioned murder mystery thriller. It helped to establish Sherlock Holmes as the quintessential detective and crime solver, the archetype for countless others throughout literature and film. People are attracted to the character of Sherlock Holmes for his intellect, powers of observation, and perhaps most importantly, his unique means and style of solving mysteries. Holmes is often credited as the master of deduction, but that's probably selling the man short. I would say Holmes is an extraordinary practitioner of all methods of reasoning, both deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning involves making a general statement like a theory and then identifying specific examples that support it. Holmes would approach a mystery with a theory, a suspect in mind, or an idea of how it happened, and proceed to collect observations that support and refute his theory. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Of course, Holmes is also a skillful practitioner of inductive reasoning. He collects specific observations, what you might call clues, and I might call data, and extrapolates to broad generalizations. Who done it, in other words? As he has written, Holmes has incredible powers of observation and an encyclopedia-like understanding of knowledge and fact. Holmes draws clues from trifles, and with his vast knowledge, he is able to draw connections between them that all others might overlook. He makes many specific observations that help him to solve mysteries. So one could argue that Holmes is a master of both deduction and induction. If he had a theory, he backed it up with fact. If he had clues, he could solve the mystery. With his skills, there was truly no mystery that he couldn't solve. Regardless of his method, I think we can be sure of one thing. Holmes would have made an excellent geologist. Most of the methods we use in historical geology require the skills of observation and reasoning that Holmes is known for. Indeed, when a geologist ventures out to the field to study Earth history, they either go looking for specific data to support their hypothesis and practice deductive reasoning, or they collect a variety of new data on rocks and fossils and other things and develop an entirely new theory using inductive reasoning. As a student learning about historical geology, you should focus for now on developing your inductive reasoning skills and powers of observation. Deductive reasoning will come later when you know more about Earth history and can formulate some testable hypotheses of your own. One of the most important uses of inductive reasoning in geology is called relative dating. Relative dating 
is the science of determining the relative order of past events, such as deposition, erosion, intrusion, and faulting, by looking at rocks. Because it is relative dating, you are only focused on the order. Which event came first? Which came second? Third? Fourth? And so on. And usually, you aren't worried about every event, only the most important ones. Geologists identify these past events by studying rocks in the field. They go out to massive exposures and outcrops. They also visit quarries and mines where rocks are excavated and exposed. And they examine rocks pulled out of boreholes, holes drilled into the earth for the purpose of exploring the subsurface. By doing so, they collect a variety of specific observations or clues for studying earth history. They identify intrusive igneous rocks, like this diabase dike intruding a sedimentary rock called a conglomerate. They observe geologic faults, the large fractures in the crust of our planet where rocks slide and move past each other. And geologists search for erosional surfaces and other signs of exposure weathering and erosion in the past. They also search for unconformities, places where rocks appear to be missing in the geologic record as a result of erosion. All of these things provide us with evidence of major events in Earth history. We use geologic cross-sections for relative dating. As you may recall, Many important geologic structures are illustrated in sections, such as this one, including igneous intrusions, faults and fractures, erosional surfaces, and unconformities, in addition to the boundaries between rocks of different ages, lithologies, and facies. We can relatively date these features using the principles of sedimentary geology. Take, for example, this very simple example. The law of superposition tells us that old strata are located below young strata. Therefore, take, for example, this very simple example. We can observe that there are four horizontal layers called strata. The law of superposition tells us that old strata are located below young strata. Therefore, we can use induction to reason that the bottom layer was deposited first, followed by the next level, and the next level, and so forth. Note that the third stratum from the bottom contains fragments of the second. The principle of included fragments tells us that if a rock contains a fragment, then the rock must be younger than the fragment. Not surprisingly, then, the principles of superposition and included fragments are in absolute agreement here. The second layer must be older than the third because it is lower in the section and its fragments occur inside of the third stratum. Note how this section also includes an intrusive igneous rock structure called a dike and an erosional surface at the top. We can use the principles of sedimentary geology to relatively date these structures too. The principle of cross-cutting relationships tells us that in cases where one rock or structure interrupts the continuity of another, the rock doing the interrupting is younger. In this case, the intrusive dike cross-cuts all of the sedimentary rock strata. It interrupts all of their continuity. Therefore, it must be the youngest rock. Likewise, the erosional surface cross-cuts the dike. Erosion obviously happened after all of the rocks were in place, 
including the fourth stratum and the intrusive igneous rock. As you can see, relative dating really is just an exercise in inductive reasoning. You collect observations in the field and make observations of geologic sections and then infer the sequence of events. Of course, let's not trivialize it. Relative dating gets much more complicated. Notice how this example includes a fault, tilted beds, and an angular unconformity, in addition to two intrusive rocks and an erosional surface. Yes, the section is more complex, but this only means that you need to make more observations. The principles still apply. The law of superposition tells us that the old sedimentary strata are located below the young layers. The principle of original horizontality means that the layers must have been laid down horizontally. We know that the beds must have been tilted before the Cretaceous conglomerate was deposited on top of the Devonian sandstone. Indeed, there is missing rock and missing time at that boundary, which is an erosional surface. Note how dike Y cross cuts all of the strata below the erosional surface and how it is tilted in the same direction as the strata. Again, the principle of cross cutting relationships. It must have formed seventh. It formed after the Devonian sandstone, but before the Cretaceous conglomerate. What about the fault? Do you see how dike Y and the strata appear to be offset across the fracture? This is another example of a cross-cutting relationship. It is the result of rocks sliding past each other after the fault formed. This means that the fault must have formed after the Devonian sandstone and after dike Y. As you can see, the fault However, is truncated by the erosional surface. It buds up to it. This is yet another example of a cross-cutting relationship. It means that the fault must have formed first and then weathering and erosion destroyed the rocks on both sides of the fault, leaving the uniform surface. At this point, we are just left with the Cretaceous conglomerate Cretaceous shale and sandstone, and second dike, dike X. Again, the principles of superposition and cross-cutting relationships can help us. The Cretaceous conglomerate occurs above the erosional surface, so it must have been deposited after the period of erosion that created the angular unconformity. But it must be older than the Cretaceous shale and sandstone because it occurs below it. All of the sedimentary rocks, nonetheless, are cross-cut by dike X, so the intrusive structure must have been the last thing to form. No matter how hard relative dating may be at times, the most important thing is not to give up. Instead, think of it like a puzzle. Some puzzles are small, simple, and easy, and you might have aid in various forms to help you complete it. Other puzzles are more challenging, either for you or everyone. Again, don't give up. Given time and effort, virtually all puzzles can be cracked. The best thing to do is approach Earth history like Sherlock Holmes might. Embrace the challenge and have faith that there is an answer to your mystery.